There's an argument in why not try, because the downsides of why not try are catastrophic, you know, especially with climate change. 10 minutes, two change makers. I'm not just going to sit down and let this happen again. One sweet solution. Join me, Amelia Hoy, in conversation with Tony's favorite change makers. Hey, Amelia, how are you? In a five-part series that addresses shaking up the status quo. If this is the future that we're headed towards, holy crap. And addressing some of society's issues. Cat Chakrabadi was working in tech when he became disillusioned by the amount of positive change he was able to enact through his work. He joined the campaign for presidential candidate Bernie Sanders and co-founded an organization called Brand New Congress with a lofty goal, launch hundreds of progressive candidates into congressional races. His success became known worldwide when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez beat out a sitting and powerful politician, thus becoming the progressive voice of a new generation. He became her chief of staff and is now working on a Green New Deal, a plan to make America's economy more sustainable and fair. He's in San Francisco. Let's see what he has to say. Hello, SciCat. Hi, Amelia. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. It's good to meet you. Good to meet you, too. How have you been able to get things done during this time and what have you been focusing on during COVID-19? I think also this is a, is a very unique opportunity for massive change. So how have you been able to incorporate that into your work and been able to do your work? Yeah, you know, so we, um, so at New Consensus, you know, we put together some plans back in March, we put together some plans of like how to tackle COVID-19 COVID-19 sort of with the same um, approach that we used in the Green New Deal to tackle climate change. So we kind of put together some plans for like, here's a way the government can take action. And we're not saying, you know, the government controlling the economy. We're just saying the government can set up projects and the government can direct start parts of the economy to do the things that we know we have to do. So make sure the essential services keep going. Um, make sure that we're producing the PPE for our, you know, not just our nurses and doctors, but every essential worker. And make sure that the basic stuff doesn't be, we don't have a shortage of, you know, food and uh, sanitation and all that stuff that we need for society to keep functioning. So basically breaking up how to tackle COVID into these projects. You came from tech, a lot of money and power and possibility in that industry. Um, what would be your sales pitch to yourself? Yeah, go into Congress and put <laughs> throw a lot of wonderful people for, to, right in front of the, the wolves and lions. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, you know, I, I would have never tried to get anybody individually to run for Congress or probably run myself. And, and but here's the thing is I, I was working in tech and I was totally part of the generation that got sold the dream that tech, you know, and innovation is going to save the world. Right. And like that's what drew me to tech. And uh, and you work here long enough and you're in San Francisco and you're in the Bay Area and you see like. If this is the future that we're headed towards, holy crap, you know, that's not what I want to be working towards. There's this <laughs> widespread homelessness and inequality is off the charts. Um, all the wealth and power that tech is getting, what's it doing with it? It's not actually able to even uh, make the local, you know, the community here any better, right? So that, that seemed like not the approach, you know? So then, you know, it really did seem like the, to solve the big problems, to create you know, to end climate change, to fix poverty, it's gotta be the systemic approaches that really only the government has the power to enable and to, to help enact. So that's what got me into wanting to work on politics and I got into Bernie Sanders' campaign. But with Congress, you know, the reason I got excited and the way we actually convinced people like AOC to run and, the, and uh, Jamal Bowman to run wasn't, we weren't really pitching them on this idea of go run for Congress. We were pitching them on this idea of run as a team with a group of people, and and if a group of you can get in there, you could actually get do something huge and massive and very impactful. You know, AOC went in there with three other Justice Democrats, which was Ayanna Presley, Ilhan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib, and the four of them together were, I think, able to do about as much as four people can do in Congress and create the pathway for a new generation of people to come in in 2020 and then 2022. Was there any other, were there any other options for you as far as establishing a systemic change? And why not choose a more incremental route? 
I mean, you make it sound like I, I was just this guy, like figuring out how to change the whole world. And I was like, ah, this didn't work. So I'm just going to go change over there. You know, I, I, it was more that I, I just got kind of disillusioned with tech and I quit, you know, and I, and I didn't know <laughs> what I wanted to do. I just knew it wasn't <laughs> that. Um, and that was around the time that uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign just had started. He just started saying these basic truths that really landed. You know, he just started saying these things about inequality is a huge problem that no other politician that I could remember really spoke about in that way up until that point. And the incredible thing when he said it was thousands of people started showing up to hear him speak, you know, and it was this rally and it was clearly this movement. So I just kind of got caught up in that. You know, I, I, I wasn't sure I was not a political person at all. I had no idea what progressivism was or left or right or whatever it was. Uh, all I knew was here's a guy talking about some of the big problems. He seems to have some big ideas. And uh, people were excited by it. So I just, uh, you know, scrabbled to get involved in any way I could. I just started volunteering and I knew how to program. So I started programming stuff. But the incredible part of that experience was that was what put me in touch with uh, all these people who uh, felt the same way. You know, they wanted to get big systemic change and they wanted to do it in a way that actually helped the vast majority of people. And no one's really thinking about these, you know, widespread poverty and the deindustrialization causing so many people, you know, 80% of Americans to uh, lose the quality of life that they used to have, or, you know, people living paycheck to paycheck and a single medical emergency is going to cause bankruptcy. So those are the problems that I, I wanted to solve, you know, I really wanted to work on or be a part of a team that's working on, you know, in any sort of way. Just to talk a little bit about the um, the Green New Deal, just to kind of jump over there because it's a really important topic. What what made it so different from earlier plans that intended to tackle climate change? What the Green New Deal really introduced, I mean reintroduced, because it's not a new idea at all. It's as old as America. It's as old as Alexander Hamilton and you know what used to be called the American system of economics. Um, which now America does the least of, which is just this idea that markets exist as a tool um, for us to use to satisfy our nation's goals. You know? And so we should, as a society, invest in the projects, invest in the industries uh, that we want to invest in and do it in a way that is just and equitable. You know? like if we're going to put money in to build a new green energy society, why don't we do it in a way where everybody can share in the in the benefits of that, not just a small portion of the population? And that's, you know, kind of the environmental justice aspect of the Green New Deal. Absolutely. Now, for you, it seems so, so, so tangible and so possible and so logical. How frustrating is it for you when you sit and talk to people who don't see it the way you do whatsoever? And how do you get how do you convince them? Um, it's not not that frustrating, you know. I mean, I this is this is like part of politics. Is you, you got to talk to people, got to listen to them, and most people are coming from a place. I'd say a lot of people are coming from a place of just distrust of of uh, anything ever working. That's kind of the biggest barrier I run into, and it's a it's a reasonable distrust, you know. Like when's the last time we managed to get something to work? We just built a, a new subway stop in New York that took. 100 years and about $6 billion. So why would anyone trust that we can do anything, right? Well, to that sure. I say, but then what? You know, if we just give up faith that we can't do anything as a society, then we might as well all just pack it on home and like, and give up. Like what's, why, where's the, what's the point of, of thinking that way, you know? On the other side, you know, I think there's a distrust from uh, often the, like a lot of uh, marginalized communities and, and I mean both you know, black and brown marginalized communities, but also like white marginalized communities, like the industrialized, you know, coal country in West Virginia, that if the government does do something, they're going to get screwed, you know? And so to that, I say again, like, but that doesn't have to be that way. You know, it, we, power is not in itself a bad thing. It's just how you use power that can make it good or bad. And unfortunately, or I, I believe if you choose not to use power, you know, if you choose not to use the government, the default state will be bad for a lot of people. You know, the default is someone else is going to get that power, which in America is often corporations and, um, you know, and kind of uh, the economic, um, you know, kings of our nation. 
and they have no reason to try to make sure it's going to go well for the marginalized communities. So, you know, I, I just think there's there's a there's an argument in why not try because the downsides of why not try are catastrophic. You know, especially with climate change. Just to, to wrap up, what would you say is a key component in the DNA of, of a leader that America needs right now? Oh, man, I think there's a few few pieces. Okay. Um, you know, I think we need people who actually know how to get work done and not just be politicians and not be political. I think we need people who, uh, and the reason I like the idea of a team is I think we need a team of people who know how different parts of the economy work. Mm -hmm. And I don't just mean at like a top level, like, not just CEOs from different sectors of the economy, but also at the worker level, which is the vast majority of the economy. The real economy is the workers, you know, and is the people actually producing the stuff and making our services run. So, you know, people like teachers, nurses, doctors, engineers, CEOs, factory floor workers, everybody. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us, Saikat, and thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is very fun. All right. So you have to take care and, and be safe. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for participating in our conversation with SciCat. His story is a reminder that we need to tackle the problems, not the symptoms. And a 10-minute conversation is just the beginning, so please go to our website and read more about Tony's mission and other sweet solutions in the series.